talk was an extra one that they just added on, so I'm kind of, I'm opposed, but usually I get more people for this talk. But, uh, but no, it's all good. So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Adam Culp, as he said. You can find me on Twitter, at Adam Culp. Uh, and please, after I give this talk, please go out and rate the talk. This on joined in, it's 10465. Uh, please go out and rate the talk. I, I sincerely appreciate it. I enjoy talking. I, I, the problem for me is not talking, the problem is shutting up. Um, so I enjoy talking. And, and part of the way that I get uh, accepted to conferences is by providing the feedback that people give me to the conferences and saying, hey, they thought I did okay. Or not, you know, whichever the case might be. Uh, I welcome any, any sort of feedback. So we talk, he introduced me a little bit, but I'm a PHP 5.3 certified engineer. I work at Zen Technologies as a consultant. Um, my job at Zen is to go tell people their code sucks and point them in the right direction to fix it. That's what I do. Um, so companies contact Zen and, and ask for advice. I don't really do a lot of programming these days, at least not for Zen. I do a lot of open source programming. I have my own repositories on GitHub and I contribute to quite a few projects out there. But, um, uh, but that's, that's most of my coding. For Zen, I don't really do any coding. Um, I just consult with customers and tell them how to code and, and show them examples of best practices and things like that. So, so this talk, Refactoring 101, is pretty much what I do every day because <laughs> I, I love refactoring. Um, as I said, uh, I'm uh, the organizer of the South Florida PHP user group. We have about 550 members in South Florida. Um, also did the Sunshine PHP conference. Anybody not doing anything three weeks from now, if you want to warm up a little bit, come down to Miami. Uh, for the conference, that's what it is, and, uh, and I forgot, but I forgot my little mascot. <laughs> We're going to be giving those out so <laughs> at the conference. Um, and I'm also an ultra runner. Uh, for people who don't know what ultra marathoning is, a marathon is 26.2 miles. Ultra means more than, so I run more than 26.2 mile races. Uh, my favorite distances are 100K which is 62 miles and 100 miles. Those are my two favorite distances. And I'm also a black belt judo instructor. Now part of the reason I bring those things up is because you notice most of the things that I do require iteration. And most things in life require iteration to do them really well and get good at them. Uh, over time, you know, whether it's running, I, don't, I didn't just jump off the couch and say, I'm gonna go run 100 miles. You know, I trained and, and you have to get your body to a certain place where you can endure that distance without you know, shutting down and dying and, 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 and bad things like that. Um, judo, we all know martial arts are a lifelong uh, study to do them well. And, uh, and so they're, it's iterative. They're constantly repeating. Coding, developing, uh, even refactoring is iterative. It's not something you just sit down and do one time. Refactoring is something you do in iteration in small steps. Now throughout this talk, one of, my, one of my most favorite references for refactoring is this book by Martin Fowler. Anybody read this book? This book is awesome. Um, any developer should have this book on their bookshelf. I, I don't say that about too many books. There's really only four books in, in development that I feel that developers should have on their bookshelf. This is the number one. Um, and if you haven't read it, please go out and read it. Now in this talk, I'm going to be covering a lot of material that's covered in this book. Um, my code example that I use in this talk, because I'm going to show you some code and we're going to do some refactoring. Um, I'm not going to physically be doing it here because uh, I, I, I like being a little bit more predictable when I'm doing presentations. So what I'll do is I'll show you screenshots of code that's been refactored in, in a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, sequence. But the code is based on the code in this book. Now this book, all the code is Java, but it's done easily enough that you can understand it. I actually rewrote the Java in PHP, so all the code examples in this book I rewrote in PHP and they're out on my GitHub uh, uh, account. Uh, I'll provide the URL for that in the end and it's also in the slides. So if you want to see the code to go along with all the samples that I'm doing in this uh, talk, as well as uh, code that you could look at as you read this book, it's just a duplicate but it's done in PHP instead of Java. So what is refactoring? Refactoring according to Wikipedia, is the process of changing a computer's program source code without modifying its functional behavior. So the idea behind refactoring is not to change your code. It's not to, or not to change the way the code, um, the end result. So, 
So we should not be adding functionality when we're refactoring. We're really only improving readability in the way that the code works. Uh, we're simplifying the code. Did you have a question? Well, does, does like making making it run faster or any of those kind of it's work possible. It's possible. It's uh, possible. Keep in mind that I'm only talking about refactoring. Optimization is not refactoring. Uh, and I'll cover a little bit more about that as I go through it and, and, and to give a little bit more depth in that. So refactoring is actually something different than adding functionality. In reality, what we do is we wear two different hats. Okay, so first we add functionality, we put on our coder hat, and then we go back afterwards and we refactor to perfect the code, make it a little bit better. So we put on our refactoring hat. There are two separate processes. First we code, then we refactor. Then we go back and code some more, then we go back and refactor it. The, the refactoring phase is not adding functionality. It's not adding code. All it's doing is tweaking the code that we already created and making it better, making it um, you know, easier to read, maybe run a little bit faster because you're gonna, you, know, you might optimize it as you're refactoring on accident only because you're just following best practices with the code. Um, but again, the idea is not to change it. Um, the idea is just to, to tweak it and make it better. So why refactor? When it comes to refactoring, some of, the pri some of the primary reasons we do that is to pre prevent code decay. Over time, can you imagine, uh, who here writes perfect code the first time? The first time? <laughs> now, I mean, none of us do. None of us can sit down and actually write code and then come back a week later and say, that's perfect. You know, none of us do that. It's just not the way it works. So if we did not go back and refactor, imagine how bad our application would be over time. You have to refactor your code to prevent that decay, to get the code clean it up. Um, another reason to refactor is, uh, to pr uh, uh, is because maybe you had poor design. Maybe you did something wrong, you, know, you, you created some other code, and now this, all of a sudden this poor design. So we go back and tweak that. Uh, we might want to preserve the design. You know, because again, we're not writing perfect code the first time. So as we're adding code, we might lose some of the design, the intent of what we wanted to design the code to be like. So refactoring, we can get it back in line with what we wanted as far as our, 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 uh, the overall design. It also allows us to reduce duplication. You know, oftentimes when we're coding, we do, we do write repeat of code. We might copy and paste from one place to another. So then we go back later and we refactor it so that way we're not repeating and, and we're making our code uh, a little bit more dry. And we refactor to improve maintainability to make it easier, <coughs> excuse me, to make it easier for developers following behind us to enhance the code. Makes it easier to onboard new developers by, by doing a refactor because then the code's easier for them, <coughs> excuse me, to come in and, and add to. Um, it helps code faster. If you've cleaned up your code while refactoring, it makes the code easier to read. We spend most of our time reading code versus writing. You know, not many times do we just sit down and just start writing code. We spend a lot of time reading code so that we understand what we need to add to the code or where we need to add code. First, we have to read it. And, and if, the code is, if the code is bad because it wasn't following our conventions and standards and things, that means we spend a lot more time reading it. So refactoring can fix that. Re refactoring gets it back in line to our standards and things, so that way it makes it faster for us to add new code because we're not spending time, uh, as much time reading the code. Refactoring can help us locate bugs. Now, don't, uh, don't mix that up with it can help us fix an application. If your application's broken, you should not be refactoring. You, you don't refactor a broken application ever. You know, fix the application, then refactor it. Um, but if you have a small bug, you know, the application is still working, but you have a small bug, sometimes you might not be able to locate the bug. So by going in and refactoring, the bug might, bug might uh, surface for you. So that you can say, oh, there it is. You know, there's where, there's where it is, and so now I can fix that. <coughs> Again, it's not a broken application, it's just a small bug. Um, refactoring is a professional thing to do. It helps us build better applications. But we're, we take pride in our work. The more you refactor it, the cleaner the code base becomes through your refactoring, the more pride we take in our work. And it helps us reduce smelly code. So again, that's some of the reasons why we refactor. Uh, going into code smells a little bit more. Does everybody know what code smells are? Who doesn't know what code smell is? Okay, that's fine, good, good. 
So code smells are indicative of potential problems. A code smell by itself doesn't mean that it's a bad coding practice. It means, you know, it's not to say that if, if, the, if there's a code smell that it's bad code. It just means that, ah, oh, this is something that's considered a smell, so there may be something underlying that is bad that I need to fix. Okay, so that's what a code smell is. So when I talk about code smells, keep in mind that I'm not saying that these, this is bad code. I'm just saying that these code smells kind of give us an indication that there might be some issues there. So some, some types of code smells would be duplicate code. You know, if you have code copied and pasted from one place to another, that's a code smell. Uh, long methods. If you have functions that are really long, you know, really long functions, how long should a function be? Page. <laughs> well, it depends on the page, right? So if a page is 20 lines, I'm good with that. <laughs> um, I generally, as a general rule, I look for my functions to be less than 20 lines of code. You know, if it's longer than 20 lines of code, to me, I consider that a code smell personally. Now, uh, but yet, at the same time, I have written functions thousands of lines long. You know, I mean, in the early days. I don't do it anymore, but, uh, but I have written some pretty god-awful functions. Um, but that being said, I mean, it, it is considered a code smell if your functions are very long. Part of the reason for that is because a function should really only do one thing. And you don't really need a lot of code to do one thing. So if you're, if you're keeping your functions nice and small, so they're only doing one thing, 20 lines is pretty significant. You know, uh, that, that's a pretty long one. What's that? You can do a lot of things in 20 lines. You can do a lot in 20 lines, yeah. You can, a lot of damage, too. Um, <laughs> large classes, the same thing. If a class is, is really large, you know, maybe you have a, a whole bunch of functions in there, or maybe the, you know, there's just a lot of lines of code is also indicative. It's a, it's a smell. Um, it indicates that there might be some issues there. Um, a class uh, solves a problem. Or a, you know, a, a, where a function does one thing, or a method does one thing, a function solves one problem. And then the methods within that class take care of small pieces of that problem. So that's the thing. And, and generally, if your class tends to be too long, it means that it's solving more than one problem. So that's a good indicator that, there, that there's some issues there. And you might be able to break out some, some code and some logic. Long parameter argument lists. Um, this one kind of makes sense, right? So if we're keeping our functions nice and small, and they're only doing one thing, how many parameters do you really need to pass in? You know, uh, as a general rule, I try to keep I try to keep my parameter list under three. You know, three or under. Three is extreme. Generally, I'm only going to pass one or two. If I need something more robust, and, and I'm gonna, well, especially if I'm going to do dependency injection or something like that, I'm going to inject in an object or or an array or something like that. So that way I can, I can kind of minimize what I'm passing in. But again, uh, generally we're looking for functions to have only a, a few arguments passed into them because it's only doing one thing and you only need so much data to do one thing. Uh, so it should be very simple. Divergent change, that's where you make changes um, in your code and you find yourself having to make changes in a lot of other places in your code to accommodate the change. Shotgun surgery is where you didn't make those changes, but then all of a sudden you've got all kinds of problems popping up all over your application, right? So then you have to do shotgun surgery uh, to go back and fix it. Feature envy, where a method uh, uses parts from another class. You know, so, so you know, maybe that method actually belongs in that other class versus in this one. It's a potential code smell. Again, uh, keep in mind that none of these things are bad by themselves. It's just a smell that there might be issues there, right? Uh, data clumps. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, data clumps, where a lot of data tends to travel together. Uh, generally, it's, it's good practice to put those in an object of some sort and pass them, you know, and keep them all together. Uh, primitive obsession, uh, that's not too much of a problem in PHP because we don't have, we don't have really strongly type, strong typing or anything like that, but the primitive obsession can be a problem. I mean, if you're passing a string instead of a date and then you're trying to use, it, use, use a, a string as a date, you know, that doesn't work real well, so that kind of goes along with that. Switch statements. Uh, I don't dislike switch statements. However, switch statements can be a code smell because maybe you're sacrificing polymorphism in your application. Maybe you could do something a little bit differently, you know, using, you know, I don't know, like a state pattern or something like that in your code uh, and, and, and introduce polymorphism in your application versus, you know, doing a lot within your, within your switch statements. <coughs> Some other things like parallel, 
inheritance hierarchies where you're forced to create a subclass somewhere in your application because you created a subclass in another place. You know, so just to follow suit and follow convention, you end up creating things. Lazy classes where you have a class that's not really doing much of anything. You know, maybe you can just get away, you know, take the class away, you know, because it's not really doing much. Speculative generality, where you build something for the future. We don't do that, right? We don't, we don't build anything and say, oh yeah, I built this, I'll just keep it there for now. I'm not using it, but I'll keep it here in the code. And then after a while, you have things that like all over your code base, and, and you kind of look at it, and you're like, why did I put that there? Why is it here? I look in, look, I look in the version control, it says it's been there for two years. I don't know why it's there. You know, um, uh, temporary fields using temporary fields. How many people use temporary fields in their, in their application? Where you dollar sign I, right? We, we use temporary fields. Now I'm not saying don't use temporary fields, but I'm saying if you're using temporary fields a lot, it can be a code smell. You know, it could it could hint to potential problems uh, because if you create a temporary field to be handled and you're using that throughout your throughout your function, who's to say you're not changing it throughout that function multiple times, right? And then, you know, so now you have to figure out where you originally set the value and, uh, and then you run into issues similar to a global um, within a function and that can be problematic. Again, it's not bad practice, it's just a smell, it's potential. You know, there's potentially something wrong. Uh, message chaining, where you have an object asking another object and that, that object then asks another object for something and you, you, you dig the hole. Man in the middle, uh, where you have a director a, a, a class in the middle or something in the middle that's directing traffic, you know, and unnecessarily. It, it, maybe you just get rid of the man in the middle and clean that up. Inappropriate intimacy where your classes are sharing private parts. That shouldn't be done. <laughs> that shouldn't be done. There's a reason why it's private. <laughs> just don't put it out there. Um, data classes where you have a data where you have a class and all it's doing is just a bunch of getters and setters and not really doing any logic, not really doing a lot. Now I'm not saying it's bad. It's just a possible a possible indicator of some some spoilage somewhere. Comments. Everybody comment their code, right? Everybody comments their code. Yes. Yes. Good. Comments are great. However, it can be a code smell if it's covering up bad code. You know, if you have to comment and explain why you did something in your code, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't have to explain what you're doing in your code. Business people are not in your code. They don't need to read what the code's doing. Other programmers can look at your code and figure out what it's doing. Their comment should be a high level explanation of, of hey, the next 20 lines is going to do this, you know, or the next five lines or whatever the case is going to do. If you're explaining your code, for the sake of, of, of making it understandable, you need to fix your code. Make your code less misunderstandable. Um, but do comment. Do include comments in your code. So another, uh, one of the things I like to point out when it comes to refactoring is the rule of three. Anybody heard of this? The rule of three. So if you, if you code something once and then later on down the line you need that snippet of code again, you know, you're in a hurry, somebody's pushing on you, go ahead and do it again. You know, go ahead, copy paste in one place to another. But, and, and, you know, if it happens the first time, you just do it. Second time, you kind of wins a little bit, and, and, you know, because you know you're copying it. But if it comes down to the third time, it's time to re refactor and clean that up, dry it up, you know, get it all in just one place. So that's, that's what we call the rule of three. And if three strikes, then you then make sure you clean it up. So when do we refactor? And when we refactor is there's really no special time to refactor. You should not, in your, in your projects, you should not be setting aside a special time to say, okay, this, I'm going to refactor here. And I'm going to do it for an hour or whatever the case might be. Refactoring should be done in small steps. It should be done constantly. So again, you're adding code, refactor, add, refactor, add, refactor. It should be a continuous thing. You, uh, over time, as you start estimating how long it takes you to do this, to do some coding and add functionality, you'll learn that, well, if I add functionality, I know I'm gonna probably need about an hour's worth of refactoring mixed in it. So it, it now takes this much time for me to do that. So you include it in your, in your time estimates. Um, you don't just decide to refactor. Refactoring should give you something. You know? So you should have something, uh, something attainable at the end of it. You know, cleaner code, more, more, uh, more 
more design, you know, a, a better design and everything else. Um, you should do, refactoring also comes in handy pr prior to adding functionality. But by doing that, then you've cleaned up the code enough so that adding functionality is much easier. You know, so you do that, you refactor again. You're not adding functionality at this point, you're refactoring, then you add the functionality after you've cleaned up the code to allow the, the functionality adding to be much simpler, much easier. <coughs> And also you might want to do it to highlight a bug like we talked about earlier. Uh, during code reviews is a good time to refactor. Often, I do, I do peer reviews uh, quite often for, for friends. And um, you know, I, I work often by myself. And, and I know many other freelancers who do a lot of work by themselves. So they, occasionally they'll pass me their code and they'll say, hey, can you do a code review on this? Do, do a peer review. And oftentimes what I'll do is I'll refactor while I'm doing the peer review. And it helps me to understand their code a little bit better um, as I'm going through. You know, fresh eyes look at things a little bit differently. And the idea behind the peer review is not just to look at the code and say, yeah, that's good. The idea behind the peer review is to look at it and give feedback. You know, well, maybe you could have done it this way. Doesn't mean you have to do it, but maybe you could try this. You know, and through refactoring, that can highlight some of those things. And then you end up with a lot more concrete results out of the, out of the process as well. <clears throat> How many people have been faced with an old application and it sucked? It was somebody else's code, or maybe your own. <laughs> and you're, left, you're stuck with the thing, well, okay, well, they, they want me to add functionality to this. Do I rewrite it or do I refactor it? We've all been there. We've all been there in our experience. And, and generally what happens is we, we take the easy way out. And we say, you know what, I'm just going to rewrite it. You know, and we, we and we talk with business, and we try to get the business to let us rewrite. Please let me rewrite this; it sucks. Um, and and sometimes they give in, sometimes they don't. So there's many different things to take into account with that. First, it's expensive, right? If they just paid a team of developers, you know, let's let's think about this for a moment. We have a team of five developers, or even three developers, and developers are making you know fifty, sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, if you're, t if you're paying a team of developers six months to a year to develop an application, and they're saying, now we need to rewrite it, all of a sudden the business person is like, what do you mean? I just paid you this amount of money for a whole year. It's like $300,000. I don't want to pay you that again. You know, uh, So business has a very tough time justifying it. And, and we as developers have to look at it as that and realize that, wow, yeah, it is quite expensive for that when you start adding up all the salaries and the time for business, right? Uh, because in order to, to do a rewrite then, you know, now they've all of a sudden been left to, in a situation where now their customer is asking for new features, they're going to have to put them on hold while you rewrite. You know, so it can be even more costly. It can actually cost the company, company to close down while you're doing a rewrite, you know, with all the best intentions in the world. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that a retaining business logic is of the utmost importance. You know, when you're rewriting an application, the idea is not to rewrite the business logic. You want to keep that. But if you're doing a total rewrite, maybe you might miss something. You know, maybe the developers might miss something. The architect uh, of the project might forget to include that in the requirements as they're rewriting the application. And the next thing you know, that you finish the application, you put it in front of the customer, and, and some major piece is missing. They're like, what's this? You see, it was just a rewrite. You know, it, it should have been simple, right? So, so those are things to, to, to look at. Some negative things of rewriting is, of, of course, it's, it's usually, it's usually a, a, a gut reaction to rewrite, and it's usually because we're lazy. You know, we, we just, why would I want to go and refactor old code and look at old code and dig through it all? It's a lot easier just to rewrite it. Uh, the perception is that. Um, and refactoring, some positive things for refactoring. Refactoring is a good teacher. As you're refactoring, you can learn a lot about the code. So let's think about this in the terms of a story. So we have a customer, right? And they're faced, they've had developers working on this project maybe a year, maybe two years, or even longer. You know, and now the developers have gotten to the point where the code is just really bad. Maybe the customer is pushing on them, maybe they don't have their unit tests in place, they don't have uh, a coding standard in place, conventions, anything like that. Onboarding developers is a nightmare. And so they're, they finally talk business into, please let me rewrite it. And business says, okay, do it. So this company, <coughs> this fictitious company, 
has a team of developers. So what do they do? They take the old experienced developers who have been there for a while, they understand the business logic, they know exactly what needs to be developed. They say, okay, you guys go build this new application. The new guys who don't understand the business quite so well, we'll let them maintain the old application. Right? So, the, so the, the experienced guys go about, they're starting to write. Sure enough, a customer comes to the business and says, I need added functionality. Otherwise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you. I'm going to go to your competitor. I need this functionality. So business, of course, has to accommodate that. So they go to the developer maintaining the old application. They say, we've got to have this functionality. Otherwise, we're going to lose this customer. We're going to lose money. So the developers add it. But what happens to the new application? <laughs> They're scope creep. Right? Now it's scope creep because they can't have a new application that doesn't include this functionality from the old application. So now the developer's creating the new application, they're re rewriting it, now their scope has crept. You know, they're, they're, they're caught behind the eight ball. They have to include this stuff. And this goes on and on and on. It continues to happen because business, that's what business is all about. They have to stay in business. They have to improve the applications. So a year goes by. And the, old, the, the new application is still not done yet. Well, the business starts to push on it, right? Say, what, what's up? We need this new application. It's been a year. You know, are we there yet? So the, the developers will start to feel the squeeze. And business is going to start pushing on them. And those old developers who trashed the first application will now do the same thing on the new application. Because now they're in a hurry. Business is pushing them, right? They're going to fall right back into their old practices. They're going to take shortcuts. They're going to do things the wrong way, the way that they used to do them, because now business is pushing on them. And before you know it, now you've got two applications that are pretty identical. And business is like, where's my new application? <laughs> yeah. And 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 you know, then what what are you faced with? Do the developers go back and tell business, well, you know, you pushed us really fast, so now we need to rewrite this one. You know, and now you've got two applications and both of them really need rewritten. So looking at that sort of scenario, it's easy, it, it makes it a little bit easier to comprehend why you would not want to rewrite an application, why it makes sense to do refactoring in a staged approach. Now granted, there is a time to rewrite. Okay, I'm not saying never rewrite an application. There is a time where that is just, it's something you have to do. But usually though, it's not gonna be if you're keeping things the same. So if you're, let's say you have a Zen Framework 1 application and you want to go to Zen Framework 2, it's a big, it's a big challenge. You know, you can refactor and do that in a staged approach, but sometimes it might be easier to rewrite an application in that thing. Or maybe you want to go from, you know, a Symphony to a Zen Framework or a Zen to a Symphony Framework, or maybe you want to go from Code Igniter to, to something else. You know, uh, doing that, that's when you're, you can't re really refactor it can't really do it in a staged approach realistically. I mean, yeah, sure, you can do it, but not realistically and not to, to, not to do it well. So, so there's a time to rewrite, but most of the time refactoring just makes sense. You know, from a business standpoint and from a developer standpoint, do it in small little steps and get there. And that's kind of what we'll cover a little bit here. So, so what do I tell my manager, right? If I'm gonna do this refactoring, if I'm gonna work refactoring into my development, how am I going to tell my manager that? Well, if you have a tech savvy manager, it's kind of easy, right? You can explain it to him and say, here's where refactoring, here's the benefit of refactoring, and he's going to understand. If you have a quality centric manager, if you stress you know, how that's going to in increase quality of the application and quality of the process, then you know, that type of manager might get it as well, and, and you might be, it might be okay. If you have a schedule driven manager who's always pushing you to get things done fast, just don't mention it. Because <laughs> he's never going to get it. He or she is never going to get it. Now, I'm not saying be deceitful. Don't be deceitful. Don't deceive. But just work it into your time. You know, and, and because that person will never understand code refactor, code refactor. So you just work it all together. It is development. Yes? Well, realistically, if you're not doing the refactoring, mm -hmm. all your other tests are going to take longer. So just oh, yeah. use their estimates. Well, exactly. Do some of the refactoring. Exactly. Exactly. But, I mean, there's multiple ways to handle that. But uh, generally, with a with a schedule-driven manager, which is common in startups, because they're in a hurry. You know, the startups are, are part of the part of the biggest crowd to work with when it comes to trying to get refactoring time. I generally don't mention it. I just pad my estimates to include the refactoring, and don't even mention it. it's just development. <laughs> you know, they don't know if I'm coding or refactoring. It's just development. So, 
When it comes time to refactor, it's a step-by-step -step process. So to start with, first thing you have to do is make sure that your code is in some sort of source control. Some sort of code control, version control, what have you, using Git, a subversion, things like that, that has to exist. If your code, if any of you right now do not have your code in some sort of source control, I don't care what you're using, I don't care if you use CBS, but you should have your code in something, please, don't do that to yourself. And that should be for every single project. Even the smallest project should be in some sort of source control. Um, because you never know when you might need to go back, you never know when you might need to have that auditability. There's lots of reasons why you should do it, but please get your code in some sort of source control. When it comes to refactoring, it's very important because you need to have that point to point to back and say, well, it wasn't broke here, I refactored, now it's broke. You know, you need to be able to roll back or, or be able to substantiate why, you know, what, what the difference is. And you can do that if it's in some sort of coding repository. Again, you must have a working application. If the application is broken, do not refactor. Fix the application first, then refactor. But you must have a working application. Yes. Well, refactoring also includes like adding in more checks and those type of things. So That's coding. That's not refactoring. Um, refactoring is 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 not that. Um, I'll show you more practical examples here. We're just about there, and then, and then you'll understand a little bit more what I'm talking about when I'm talking about refactoring. Um, so, when you refactor, you also want to make sure that you have a preloaded database because when you refactor, you want to make sure that as you're testing, it has to be repeatable. So if you test before you do the refactor and then you test after the refactor, you have to have an identical beginning and an identical end. Refactoring should not make your tests fail. If you have tests and then you refactor, your tests should still pass. You might have to go back and tweak the tests afterwards, but the pre-existing tests should still be there, should still be intact, should still, should still pass. Uh, so we preload the database so that way it's a, a static point in time uh, showing us that. And then um, also create tests. You have to have tests before you refactor. Now, am I saying unit tests? No. I realize that not all code, especially if you're refactoring it, Chances are, if you're, if you're doing a major refactor, your code sucks, all right? So we can't have unit tests. You can't really have, you, you can't start with unit tests with a very sucky code base. So have some sort of functional test. Have some sort of starting point. Even if it's an Excel spreadsheet with here's one test, here's another test, here's another test, you know, did it pass, yes or no. Even if it's just a checklist that you go down through, have some sort of tests in place. Now, ideally, you would like to refactor your code to the place where it is able to have unit tests written on it. You, know, you should have unit tests. You should thrive or strive to get to that point, okay, if you're not able to today. But uh, I realize that not all code is unit testable because you really have to change the way you do some code in, in some cases to make it unit testable. You know, Grumpy Programmer talks about that. I, I don't know if he had that talk today or if he's doing it tomorrow on, on testable code. You know, but uh, he has a very good talk on that, and he has a good book on it as well of how to write testable code. Because it, it is, um, if you're not writing your code to be testable, you're not going to be able to unit test it. You know, so it's important to understand how to write code that can be tested. Um, so that being said, as we go through, the tests are very important. Uh, in PHP, we do that with PHP unit uh, for unit testing. But the the steps that we go through is first. We ensure that all of our tests pass. And again, even if it's just functional tests, even if we're just going in a browser, clicking something and seeing the result, that's a test. You know, in, 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 if that's all you can do, then that's what you do. You ensure your tests pass, then you plan your refactor, then you implement the refactor, and then you ensure the tests still pass. If the tests still pass, you did your job. And then you, you make changes, maybe you have to add additional tests, maybe you have to do additional things, and then you start back again. You know, and then you go to the next refactor and you keep on going. But the, the thing is, is you want to make it repeatable and, and tests enable you to make it repeatable. Your tests have to pass every single time. So let's look at an example. So <clears throat> we're going to cover some code, and in this code we have, we're, we're tasked with the customer. The customer has asked, there, it's a video rental company, and the video rental company would like an HTML representation of the customer's statement. Right now they have a plain text. 
representation of a statement. But, excuse me, they would like to have an HTML representation. So now we're going to look at the code that they currently have, pre-existing code. We're a new developer on this project, so it's not code we've ever seen before. So we're going to take a look at it and see what we got. So we have a movie class. We see we have some constants there defining the movie types. Uh, and then we have some, some uh, static fields with the title and the price code. Our constructor, we're passing in a title and a price code, and then we're, we're setting those into the values. And then we have get price code, set price code, um, and also the get title. Pretty simple class. I mean, nothing extreme. Very simple. It's, it's, it's not really doing a whole lot of, of, of things. And then we also have our rental class. In the rental class, in our constructor, we're actually passing in movie, and we can see that that's type hinted, so chances are it's going to be an object of the movie that we were just looking at, right? Um, <clears throat> so we're passing that in, and we're also passing in the days rented. And then it's going through and just doing a couple things. I mean, it's doing uh, get days rented and get movie. And, and, and again, just going through some of that. And then we have a customer class. Now, in the customer class, it's a little bit larger. So we're, co we're covering this in chunks here. So in the customer, we have a couple fields. In the constructor, we're adding in a name. And then we, we're doing add rentals. It looks like we're building an array here of rentals. And we're passing in the rental object uh, into this. Uh, and we can see that that's type hinted there. So that's being added in you know, as an item in an array. And then we have get name. This class continues with a statement. Okay, and here's the statement. So remember, the customer asked us to give them an HTML representation of the statement. So this statement, we can see, we're, we're at, you know, we have total amount, frequent renter points. Those are, those appear to be uh, uh, temporary fields or that we can, we can use in there uh, throughout the thing. We're actually putting you can see here, we're just putting out raw text into the result, along with our uh, slash n, which is a new line character. So, so that's being hard coded in there, so that way we have that representation. We're looping over the rentals, and as we loop over, then we have a temporary field for this amount, and and we can see that we're adding to this amount, you know, in this switch statement, uh, you know, for depending on the type of rental. Uh, and we can see that in this switch statement, we've got the different movie types and, and everything's being calculated as far as frequent renter points and, and the total and the days rented and everything is throughout that switch statement. Now, the, 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 the function continues. And here we can see uh, now we're, we're calculating also the total being done. And then we're outputting that again as text because it's a text statement, text-based statement. And we're outputting more text here. And then we have the return result at the end. Now, how we call this and how the customer has been using this is, again, we're, we're instantiating the customer by passing the customer name. Then we build the movie. You know, so we're, we're instantiating movie. We're getting the Gladiator movie. And then we're, we're populating that in the movie that's going to bring the object in. And we pass that movie object to the rental as we instantiate it. And then we add the rental. And then we do the same thing with the second movie. And then we echo out the statement. So it's pretty simplistic, pretty simple to use. However, looking at that a little bit closer, one of the things we notice about the code that we just looked at is the statement method is actually quite long. And it's doing a lot. Remember what I said about functions? A function should really only do one thing. How many things was that function doing? It was calculating frequent render points, calculating total. Uh, outputting the statement. I mean, it was doing a lot of stuff there. Um, so, so you know, we might want to look at simplifying that. It's too long. Uh, and right now, we're not able to create an HTML representation of that because there's hard coded values in there slash n for the for the text. You know, for a new line and things like that. We can't just include that into an HTML file and output it. So, so we're kind of stuck. We, we really need to clean up that statement function so that way we can output an HTML representation but still maintain the text version. Yeah, we can't get away from that. Also, we have a switch statement that's doing all that calculation and everything and we're sacrificing polymorphism in the application. 
where we're, we're the, in, inside that switch statement, it was calculating the frequent render points in the total, and, and I mean, it was doing a lot inside that switch statement. It would be a lot easier if we were in a, able to break that out and then call the movie type, you know, however that might be. And then we also need to be able to determine the class and type, um, and then, you know, calculating the frequent render points and the, the rental price, grand total, everything. So the statement method is really something that, that we need to focus on before we can even make the HTML representation. We need to refactor this to make it usable as a, as a, an HTML representation. Is everybody seeing that? Yeah, you able to see it? Okay, good, good. So, some additional notes is right now, the way that that was done, uh, the way that the statement method worked with the switch statement and the way that everything was done, we're not able to really change how movies are classified very easily. There, it's, it's in constants. It's being stored in constants, and we're, we're, we're uh, you know, using those straight through that switch statement. So it's not really easy to, to kind of make that more fluid and easier to use. And, and one thing that we always know is customers always want change, right? They always want to enhance the application. They always want to make it better. They always want new features. And right now, the movie classification, the frequent renter points, the, the rental days per type, and the, and the price calculation, those are all things that aren't really, that, that aren't really in a situation where we're going to be able to change those easily. I mean, right now, they're all pretty much hard-coded throughout there. So our objective, we've determined, in order to get this HTML representation, we have to refactor, is we need to clean up the statement method. We need to shorten it. We need to extract code and encapsulate it in other functions, so that way, you know, the calculations of things can be done out, you know, outside of that statement class, and we need to keep it dry. So that's our objectives here. Now, what did I say the first thing is we do before we start refactoring? Make sure it works. <laughs> test, exactly. We have to test. We have to make sure it's working. So we test the application. In this case, we don't have unit tests. So I'm not going to cover unit tests here. Let's just uh, go with it because I can only cover so much in the time period of a talk, too. So um, let's just keep in mind that as I say test, let's assume that we have unit tests or something behind the scenes to do the testing, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at that switch statement. And we're going to extract that with it. We're going to use what's called extract method. And using extract method, we're going to take this switch statement, which is about 20 lines of code, right? And we're going to take that out and put it into its own function. And then we're going to call that function uh, this amount for uh, instead of keeping it inside that the, the statement. We're going to call it out all by itself. Um, and then, so we put the call here, and then what we end up with is a nice, a nice function that keeps all that within it. And then we return whatever was, was calculated inside the uh, switch statement. Not a huge change. All we did was create a function. It, it didn't change the way the, the, the application works, right? We're still outputting the same thing. We're calling to the switch statement the same way we did when the switch statement was in there. So we should be able to just go run test again. There, should, there was no change. The test should still pass. If this test fails at this point, we did something wrong. But we shouldn't have to change any of the tests. The test should still work. Now, to clean it up a little bit more, you know, uh, it was determined that, you know what, now that we've moved that out, you know, we want to make a little bit more sense. If we loop over this rentals, each really doesn't define it well. We want to make our code as self-documenting as we can. So what we do is we rename it to rental, so as we're so each iteration over this for each is now going to be rental, and then we change that in multiple places, and and then we do some other renaming as well. You know, when we look at the method that we broke out, you know, when we did the extract method, we now need to change rental there, and then instead of uh, instead of this amount, we're going to change that to be result, and it just makes a little bit more sense because we're outputting result at the end. So again, this is just renaming. We're not changing any functionality. This is refactoring. Okay, this is not changing functionality. But we still want to test and make sure we didn't break anything. You know, we always want to test to make sure we didn't break anything so that way we can continue moving forward. And then we want to if we want to look at it a little bit farther, we have this function now, or, or this called amount for 
And, and actually what we're doing there is we're getting charged. So it just makes sense to rename that. So we do that. We change it. To, we do, we're just changing the name of the function. And we're calling it by that new name. And then we test again, make sure that we didn't break anything. Continuing on, now that we've moved that out, right, we've moved get charge out, so it's all by itself, we kind of notice that, hey, everything inside that get charge function that we have is not really, not really has anything to do with the customer. Get charge is a get charge of the rental, right? So it just makes sense. We move it from the customer instead to the rental. Uh, because it's just where it makes sense. It doesn't make sense to keep it with the customer. Since it's using parts of the rental, it doesn't make sense to be in the customer. You should keep your things together as much as you can. Again, our, the purpose of a class is to solve a problem. Get charge was not solving the problem of giving a price for a customer. It's solving the problem of giving a price for a rental. So we move it to rental. And, and it's quite simple to do that. All we're doing is changing. We're calling the rental object. Uh, and then the method would then just be moved right over. And, and, and now when we do that, we were able to change some things because one of the things that we were doing is now we can call get days rented from within the rental instead of having to call it externally. So now that makes that a little bit easier. So we kind of clean it up a little bit as we go, <coughs> as we go through in this stage of the refactor. Now that we've done that, again, we've still not changed any functionality. The application still works exactly the same way as it did. All we're doing is neatening things up and putting them where they belong. So again, our tests should pass with no issue. And we do test after each stage in the refactor. Next, we take a look at it a little bit more uh, to, to clean this up so that way we can have our text for our HTML representation. You know, we look, kind of look at our, uh, our temporary variables. Here we have a, a temporary variable. We're creating this amount and we're populating it with get charge. So we take that away completely. And instead, what we're going to do is we're actually going to call to the rental get charge and call it directly there. No sense having a temporary variable called this amount and reusing that down here. It just doesn't make sense to reuse it. Yes? How, how many times do you need to use it before you want to have a variable in scope? It really depends on the complexity of what you're calling. Now, if now keep in mind, this get charge was pretty simple, right? I mean, it was just a little 20 line uh, switch statement that calculated things for you. So it's not very complex and it doesn't really have a lot of overhead. If there was a lot of business logic there, you might not want to do this where you're going to end up calling it twice. You know? Now, keep in mind, though, this rental get charge function is being passed as an object into the customer. You know, so it already exists. So by calling it twice, we're not causing the calculation to happen twice. It's going to call it. It's going to use the temporary variables in the other in the other class. So in this case, we're not really adding any overhead, so to speak. Now, after we do that, of course, we didn't really change functionality. The application should still continue to work, but we test anyway, just to make sure we didn't type something wrong or whatever. No, we don't want any typos. Typos are the biggest problem when refactoring. It's generally not that you break code. It's generally that you mistype something. You know, so by running your test again, you ensure that you catch that and can go back and fix it. <clears throat> now, our next target that we looked at is, okay, well, we have frequent runner points being calculated in, inside of our statement method as well. It would be, it'd just make a lot more sense if we broke that out. You know, so don't do the calc, we, won't, we don't want to do our calculation in there, so instead, we break it out to its own function, and here, here's where, where we do that. Now, uh, and then based on the, because the frequent runner point was only happening in the case of new releases. So now we can, you know, we got two points for a new release and one point if it wasn't a new release. Sorry, I'm confusing myself. So we can do the calculation here and just call it directly like this. So we extract the method out. Again, we're, we're the objective is to shorten that statement and make it more dry. So we're moving things externally and calling them from within that statement. And then after we do that, again, we test, make sure everything's working well. And then we have more temp variables that we want to attack. So we have total amount as zero. We're, we're specifying that right at the beginning of the statement. And then we come down here and we're adding it. We get charged. We're just we're, we're incrementing it, so to speak. We're just adding on every charge in this manner. 
and it just makes sense instead to move that all out into its own function and then we do our calculation here. Now when we do that, we also have to move out a loop, you know, because we have to loop over the rentals to get still calculate that. But now we've taken it out of our statement and our calculations out here. We can use this in multiple places if we wanted to. Before we could only we had to call the statement in order to get the price. You know, now we can get the price from anywhere. But you're also doing a loop twice now as well. Yep, yeah, yeah, you're also doing a loop twice. Yep, yeah, we're doing a loop here for our frequent renter points. And then we're doing the loop here for our price. Yep. Now, after we do that, we got to <coughs> test, make sure everything worked right. And then we come back. And now we're going to look at the frequent renter points. Again, this is a step by step thing, right? So your point was valid. Now you're going to do the loop twice? Well, yeah, we we're going to do the loop twice. But we come back and we still clean that up, right? So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to take the frequent renter points generation, pull that out into its own method. So now you can see our statement method. Look how look how small this is now, and it's and it's normalized. So the the point where our statement really isn't doing any calculation anymore, as it shouldn't be. It's only generating a statement. That's all it should be doing. You know, and so it should call the price outside. So here our loop now is not doing any calculation inside of our statement. All it's doing is just generating the title to output into the text in this case. Our calculation for the frequent error points is happening separately. Our calculation for the rental is happening separately. And then we test to make sure it's working fine. Yes? Aren't you affecting performance by doing that though? I'll cover that in just a moment. Okay. Yep. Good point. Very good point. Um, so now, now that we've gotten everything broken out, right, our statement method is nice and short. What we do is we copy it and paste it. Okay, we duplicate it here a little bit because we need an HTML representation and a text version. This still is pretty much text. We have tabs and we have new lines and things like that. Our HTML version is going to be different. It's going to have HTML tags. You know, so now we have two representations, but but our, our methods are very small. You know, again, we're looking at very small, very simplistic methods. We're calling out to the movie to get our title. We're calling our get charge, our get frequent runner points outside of the thing. After we create that additional method, then we test. In this case, the test is going to be the usage, because now we can either call statement text or call standard statement HTML and output whichever version we want to do. Okay. And I have a test slide again. I could probably delete that one. So to recap a little bit, and, and then we're going to talk a little bit about optimization. So most refactoring reduces code. In this case, we actually increased code. Okay, because it's just a small example. So, so in this case, it's hard to show a lot of things. Um, it, we actually included, it, it increased about 50 lines of code here. So, uh, but we've created code that is more self-documenting. You know, because we rename some things, they make more sense now. So it's easier to read our code, easier to understand. We've made it more flexible because we broke our calculation out into separate methods. So now it's a lot more flexible, and we've actually made it more testable. Now we can write tests on each of those methods a lot easier than we were able to with a big huge statement. <laughs> you know, that huge statement method before, there was no way to test that other than visually and making sure that it calculated everything right. You know, imagine writing unit tests for that. You know, there would be no way to write unit tests for that statement method the way it was, but now we can. You know, we can test everything. Now we did uh, create a loop three times because now in our, our group, get frequent renter points, our get total charge, and our statement method, they're all doing that loop. Instead, where before we were only doing the loop one time. Uh, to kind of cover that a little bit, keep in mind that refactoring, do not confuse it with optimization. Okay? In this case, we ignore optimization altogether. When you're refactoring, your intent is not to make your code run faster, it's not to make it run and, and be optimized. That's a separate process. Actually, it's a third hat. You know, so you have your code hat, your refactor hat, and your optimization hat. Generally, opt generally, when you refactor, optimization is going to be a byproduct. It's just going to happen because you're cleaning up the code. You're making things a lot more dry and making things a lot simpler. In some cases, though, refactoring, in, like in this case, for instance, we're redoing a loop multiple times. It will slow it down a little bit. You know? now, but when you optimize after refactoring, you can kind of tweak that as needed. Uh, again, this is just an example. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. This is just an example to explain how we get a statement method 
down in size and how we can create an HTML, you know, version of that. I, I might not do that, you know, in real life. Um, and again, I'm just copying code from the, that was used in the book again as an example to highlight. Here's how I might how might do that. Um, realistically, I probably wouldn't want to redo a loop three times. Um, in this case, though, it's only calculating movie rentals and how many movie rentals is the customer really going to have? They're going to be at the counter at the at the rental, you know, rental office. So there's really not a lot of a, not, a lot of uh, you know robustness to that application to begin with. So chances are we're probably okay. We're probably not going to notice any slowdown in that application. Yes, uh, I know down that last point. Mm -hmm. uh, the future. Do you think there's a point? where you get everything too separated or maybe too abstract where there is because I know I've seen people where they refactor and maybe they forget the functions way down mm -hmm. at the end of the file. Yeah. And you have to kind of do a lot of tracing around yeah. the file just to find what exactly what's Yeah going. and and I mean you gotta kinda weigh the pros and cons sometimes and say, you know what, by breaking this out I'm actually making it harder to maintain the code in the future. I mean you have to weigh that for yourself. Um, you know, again, I'm not saying that everything we did here is the way to do it. It's just a way to do it. Um, you know, and, and getting you know, so that way I can show you an example of refactoring. You know, um, it, it, there's a lot of things you can do. We could go further now. In the code examples that I have out on GitHub, uh, which I'll give you the URL for, there's a lot more steps to this refactor. I can just only cover so much in 50 minutes of talking. <laughs> so there's still many more steps to this refactor, and it sh I, sh I also do introduce polymorphism and, and clean up that switch statement a lot more. Um, so I encourage you to go out and check out that code. In the code, I created it one file at a time. So there's file one. And then file two is file one changed. File three is file two changed. You know, so you can look at each file. I put a doc block at the top explaining the optimization I did in that file. And, and so you can look at it progressively. I would encourage you to use some sort of diff viewer like meld or beyond compare or something like that. And, and look at the two files side by side and you can see the optimization that was done for it. Again, don't crucify me on it. I'm not saying it's the only way to refactor, but it, I do highlight how to do some refactoring, some different uh, primary refactoring methods. <clears throat> Cover everything there. Yeah, pretty much did. So, in conclusion, do not refactor a broken application. Always have tests in place beforehand. If not unit testing, it should be functional testing or even manual testing. Even if it's just a step one, step two, step three, how do I test this and how do I do that repeatedly? Um, leave the code cleaner than you got it. Always, always with the objective of doing that. Try not to rewrite applications, try to refactor where you can. Learn to smell problems. You know, learn the code smells. Learn to look for them, and they'll highlight potential problems in your code. Again, they're not always bad, but uh, they could tell you that. And also, learn to love iteration. We're developers. We iterate. That's what we do. If you're doing agile development, if you're doing testing, if you're doing refactoring, you can see it's an iterative thing. It's not something you do just one big false swoop. I'm not going to go in and change 2,000 lines of code in a test. You know, <clears throat> you do it in steps. So with that, I'll conclude. This is the URL for the code that I have out on GitHub. It's a GitHub slash Adam called slash refactoring 101 to go along with this talk. I encourage you to check it out, have fun with it. Um, and, uh, and again, you can also use that code reading the refactoring book by Martin Fowler, and you can follow along. And the code follows the, the, the Java samples that he put there. Again, not the best. It's not the best code. It's not meant to be. It's just meant to be a sample. You know, it's meant to be examples of how to potentially do things. Please rate this talk out of joined in 10465. I appreciate any feedback you can give me. Uh, in my my personal blog, my tech blog is geekyboy.com. I, I put some interesting things out there once in a while. Uh, I do a lot of things with refactoring and some other things. Uh, my Twitter is at Adam Cole. Are there any questions? I think we we're asked questions during. Uh, if you have anything at all, please come talk to me afterwards. I'm here the rest of the conference, and I'm always available on Twitter uh, if you want to talk about anything. So thank you very much. <laughs>